The next section here is going to be the Sabbath through the Bible, the substance foreshadowed by the law. I've got a chart here so that we can skim through this. There are many more passages regarding the keeping of the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, which by the way, that, that is the seventh day. It's not, it's not Sunday. It's not the first day of the week. We're talking about Saturday when we talk about keeping the Sabbath of the old law. Okay. <clears throat> In Genesis 2, 2 and 3, we see some background. You might turn there with me because I'm going to use another verse as an example. So God is creating the world here. And we're being told about how He created the world. It's a narrative that all indications point to Moses having written. And so if you think about it then, what you have is God is telling His people Israel their history. In the beginning, everyone knew the history, but then the world was more and more wicked. The flood washed away that wickedness, but it's pretty evident by the civilizations, the ancient civilizations that we can learn about today, that that world became wicked and departed from a worship of God rather quickly. And so as God brings His people Israel out of the land of Egypt, He has to remind them who they are and where they came from so that they can understand where they're going and why it's so important to have a relationship with God. If we read Genesis within that context, it makes a lot of sense. And so, before we read verses 2 and 3, let's look at verse 23. This is after Adam has named the animals, and there's not found a helper like him. He's like, hey, where's, where's my female counterpart? And then God causes a deep sleep to fall on him opens up his flesh, takes one of his ribs, makes a woman out of it, closes up the flesh in its place. And then he wakes up and he sees this woman that the Lord has made for him. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now notice this next verse. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. And then it goes on with the narrative. Well, you know what we don't read about? A marriage ceremony. It's, it's kind of like this little excerpt. It's this story of how God made the woman and then they were a couple and they were in the garden. And you have in the middle of the narrative this principle that's inserted into the story. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and be joined. Do you see that as Moses tells the people of Israel who they are and where they've come from, He's explaining to them, and this is why marriage is binding. This is why this is important. It has its roots in the very foundation and beginning of mankind. The same thing is true for the Sabbath. Verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it, God rested from all His work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and earth, or this is the generations of the heavens and the earth. So again, here's this narrative. Here's how God created the heavens and the earth, the first day, the second day, the third day, and so on. And then here's what God did on the seventh day. We don't read about Adam and Eve keeping the Sabbath. We don't read about Noah keeping the Sabbath. We don't read about Abraham keeping the Sabbath or Isaac or Jacob. The next time we hear about this is in the law of Moses, in the Israelite law. God here in the, is, is telling the story. Here's where you came from. And by the way, here's where the Sabbath comes from. And even in their keeping of the Sabbath as part of their covenant, they were looking forward to another rest and another covenant that we'll see at the end of this section. That's Genesis 2, 2, and 3. That's the background for the Sabbath. As we look at Exodus 16, 18 through 30, there's a long section there, and it talks about the manna. And with the manna, uh, it was really neat because what would happen was when the dew lifted in the morning, it left behind the manna. It's almost like you get up from your tent, you look out the tent flap, there's the dew on the ground, and after the sun burns off the dew, the, the manna is left. Then they would go out and gather the manna. God told Moses to command them, don't you dare leave any of it till the next day because I'm going to provide for you manna again tomorrow. Well, of course, what did they do? Some of them left it till the next day. It rotted. It got maggots in it. It stank. It was disgusting. God made it where it didn't pay for them to 
disobey Him. God always kind of makes it where it doesn't pay to disobey Him, either in the short term, the long term, or both. It's a great training technique. And then on the, on the Friday, He tells them, you gather for two days, directly opposite of what He told them before. On Friday, you gather for two days. Leave some of it for tomorrow. And matter of fact, fix it up. Boil it, bake it, whatever you want to do to it. Because on the Sabbath, you're going to rest and you're going to need food from yesterday to partake of on the Sabbath. No food prep. He also tells them, chapter 35 and verse 3, don't build a fire on the Sabbath. So that kind of goes right along, dovetails nicely with the idea of not preparing any food on the Sabbath, doesn't it? You're not to prepare food on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to build a fire on the Sabbath. Also in Exodus 35 in a previous verse, verse 2, he points out don't work. And by the way, Many of these verses say, don't work, don't work, don't work, don't work on the Sabbath. It is a repeated theme of the Sabbath. Many of these things that I've drawn out on the graph are only mentioned in that verse. But don't work, rest on the Sabbath is mentioned in a lot of them. Okay, next column, Exodus 31, 13. It's a sign of the covenant. Isn't that interesting? It's a sign of the covenant. So if we're under a different covenant, it would make sense that we don't keep the Sabbath anymore, wouldn't it? Because we're not under the covenant, so we don't keep the sign of the covenant. Exodus 31 and 14, it carries the death penalty. Friends, if we're going to bind the Sabbath keeping, we need to be putting people to death who don't do it. That's just the truth of it. You, You need to be consistent. If you're going to bind the Sabbath, you better put people to death who don't keep it. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 mentions the idea of keep it holy. That's pretty cool. Keep it holy. Keep it you know, consecrated, sanctified. In other words, set apart to the Lord. It's His day. It's His time. It's not your time. This time is the Lord's. And then in Leviticus 16, In verse 31, it mentions the idea, in addition to it being a solemn rest, that they should afflict their souls. And the idea here is to depress your soul. Uh, And so, again, it has the idea of solemn. It's not a day of having fun, in other words. It's a day of being uh, reflective. It reminds me of Psalm 4610. To clarify... Psalm 46.10 does not talk about the Sabbath, but it reminds me of that verse where it says, Be still and know that I am God. That's kind of what they were to do on the Sabbath especially. Afflict your souls, be solemn, reflect on God. All right. So this regards, as you see at the top of the chart, Sabbath facts and regulations. Now, we're going to cover the other Sabbaths of the old law. The seventh day of the week is not the only Sabbath in the law of Israel. Look now in verses 24 and 25. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So once again, this is not at the end of every week. This is during this feast. And what are they to have? A Sabbath. And uh, do you see how that's hyphenated? A Sabbath hyphen rest, a Sabbath dash rest. That's because it's just Sabbath in the Hebrew. You shall have a Sabbath. That's all it says in the Hebrew. Uh, We've added the word rest in the English to help us understand that it's like the seventh day of the week, but it's not the same as. Again, in Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 31 now, you shall do no manner of work. Hey, that sounds like the rest that the Sabbath is all about. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. You shall afflict your soul on the ninth day of the month At evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. That last phrase makes it evident that he's not just talking about the seventh day of every week. This is the one that's in the ninth month that they are to keep. Leviticus 23, this is a different rest. He says, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, how come that's plural? There's more than just the seventh day of the week. There are all these other rest days during their feasts and so on. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gift, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord, also 
On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath, a Sabbath rest. And on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. So, again, there are many Sabbaths. In Leviticus 24, verses 4 and 5, in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. Now it's not the people resting, it's the land resting. It's in the seventh year. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. So Sabbath has this idea of rest. That's the core, the main idea. Now, we're going to look at the substance. Let's look in Hebrews chapter 4. You're going to want to turn over there. We're going to look at several verses in Hebrews chapter 4. We've seen how the Sabbaths were necessary. We've seen all of these characteristics of the Sabbath. And we've seen that it's not just the seventh day of the week, but every time the idea of Sabbath comes up, it has to do with a rest. And that God kind of laid a foundation for rest when He created the world, right? He rested on the seventh day. Hebrews 4.1 now. <clears throat> Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Verse 4, For He has spoken in a certain play, a place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all His works. So in the law of Moses, he says, you keep the seventh day holy because God rested on the seventh day. Now in the new law, under Christ, he again is bringing up this creation foundation that we are to rest. God rested from all his works. Look at verses 7 through 9. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if, David had get, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. In the old law, he said, rest on the seventh day. In the new law, he says, you're still waiting for it. The law is a shadow. The substance is in Christ. They kept the Sabbath day every single week. Looking forward to... And when was the Sabbath day? It's at the end of the week, isn't it? It's not the first day. It's not the second day. It's, it's the last day of the week. That's going to be significant as we see the rest we're waiting for here in Hebrews 4. If Joshua had given them rest, they, he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. In other words, there is a rest that God is pointing forward to. God began His work of creation. He finished it. And then He was finished working. Is God alive and powerful today? Amen. Is He still creating the world today? Nope, He's not doing that work. He is seated on His throne in heaven, isn't He? He's in a position of rest. He's still in control. He's still reigning. But He's not creating. He's not working. There's a difference. <clears throat> the conclusion in verse 9 again is, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Verse 10 beginning with here, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Did the children of Israel cease from their work? No, just like us. They got up on the day after their rest and went back to work. They still had to drive out the inhabitants of the land. They still had to deal with enemies coming in and trying to take them over. They still had to sow their field and harvest their crop. And, and do their carpentry and whatever other occupation they had to do, they still had to do all of that work. There was no rest for them. 
Spiritually, there was no rest. They still had to war, uh, fight against temptations. They still had to war against the flesh, just like we do today. If they had entered their rest, they would have stopped working. What's the conclusion? Same as the previous verse. There remains a rest for the people of God. God hasn't given His people rest yet. That's what the Sabbath is all about. It's this rest that's coming up. We'll see that. Verse 11 then says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Let's read verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Then he talks about David and Joshua, and therefore a rest remains. What's the Sabbath all about? It's about our rest. It's about the hope of God's followers to rest. When are we going to rest? It says it still remains. Well, what rest still remains for the people of God? It's heaven. It is when we are finished with this life, if we've been faithful to Him, we have the opportunity to go to heaven. That's why verse 11 is so important. And so we'll round out this lesson with the same appeal that God makes here in Hebrews. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We can fall. We can be disobedient. Nobody can force us to be disobedient, but we can choose to be disobedient, and when we do, we fall from God's grace, and we lose the hope of going to heaven and entering God's rest. That's our seventh day. That's the end of our work, is after our lives here are finished on the earth.